Today we are talking about a very interesting event. The phenomenon known as the hundredth monkey effect. Is there an invisible life and memory field that encompasses our world and all living beings? A field that allows unconscious communication between two physically distant beings. A field that our current technology and devices cannot detect. Some scientists believe that such a field indeed exists. Scientists, doctors, like the biochemist Rupert Sheldrake, who has proposed some truly fantastic and interesting hypotheses that may explain the phenomenon I mentioned at the beginning of today's video, and it is about the hundredth monkey effect. In the early 1950s, Japanese scientists began studying the behavior of a group of wild monkeys on a small Japanese island called Koshima, specifically the Japanese macaque monkeys. The purpose of the long-term study was to observe their social hierarchy, their interactions, and development. After some time, the Japanese researchers started feeding these monkeys sweet potatoes and wheat by throwing this food on the sandy beaches. The monkeys loved sweet potatoes, but they had one big problem. The potatoes and wheat would naturally get covered in sand from the beach. Although the monkeys loved sweet potatoes, they had to endure the taste of sand while eating them together with the potatoes and wheat. If you were a human in their place, it would be logical to simply wash the sweet potatoes to remove the sand. However, monkeys are not endowed with the intelligence that humans possess. This posed a small challenge, and for a while, these monkeys had to tolerate sand on their sweet potatoes. But then something really interesting happens. In 1954, scientists began mentioning a young monkey named Imo in their reports. This young monkey started taking sweet potatoes covered in sand and carried them to a small stream, where it would then wash them. This seemingly normal act for us humans was revolutionary for the monkeys. Imo then taught his mother the same procedure, and she also started washing the potatoes in the same stream. Over time, this new knowledge began to spread among the monkey population, and they started washing potatoes either in the stream or in the sea. They even began soaking potatoes in the sea because they started enjoying the salty taste. They would throw wheat, along with sand, into the sea and then collect floating seeds on the surface. This revolution among the monkeys did not happen overnight but took several years. The younger monkey population relatively quickly adopted this new knowledge, while the older ones simply could not learn these new tricks. However, with the replacement of generations, as the older monkeys died, the new generation took their place and quickly adopted this new knowledge, which became completely normal. Although this story is interesting, I'm not telling it to you because of animal adaptation, which is an indicator of their intelligence, but for another reason. When their population reached a count of 100 monkeys, something inexplicable began to happen. Monkeys on other Japanese islands and in other locations around the planet started performing the same behavior. They started washing their food to remove dirt and various impurities. Monkeys that were not in direct physical contact with each other somehow adopted this revolutionary knowledge. The question arises, how? How could such a thing be possible? And soon we will come to the interesting hypotheses of a British doctor named Rupert Sheldrake. In the meantime, scientists on the Japanese island of Koshima discontinued their research because they realized that factions had formed among the monkey groups, with stronger and more dominant monkeys starting to steal food from the weaker ones. To prevent further conflicts and preserve the population, they stopped feeding these monkeys. Years later, several scientific studies attempted to explain this phenomenon, which gained popular attention as the hundredth monkey effect. Perhaps the monkey groups simply swam to other islands and shared their newfound knowledge. Maybe other groups of monkeys learned to behave in a similar way to the monkeys on the island of Koshima, because they were fed by other researchers in the same manner. It remains unclear, and the whole story has become somewhat of an urban legend. After recounting the individuals on the island of Koshima in 1962, researchers concluded that there was no longer a group of more than 100 monkeys on the island. There were only 59. Thus, the number itself, 100, remained a mystery. This mystery was deepened by the fact that these Japanese monkeys, up until the discovery of food washing, 
did not like water at all and were not swimmers. Therefore, scientists never observed them swimming between other islands. Is there perhaps another explanation for such phenomena? Alfred Rupert Sheldrake, an English author and biologist, believes there is. This man has brought forth a very interesting concept that attempts to expand our existing understanding of biology and the mechanisms in the plant and animal world. He introduces the concept, or hypothesis, known as morphic fields and morphic resonance. What exactly is being discussed? Simplified, the entire world, including inanimate matter, as well as the plant and animal kingdom, of course, including us humans, is permeated by this invisible memory field, a field that is not limited by space and time, and the very action and reaction at the cellular level arise from this field. And it is a field that we often access, consciously or unconsciously. The activity of the monkeys on this island and their new skills have upgraded. Let's call it the existing software in the morphic field, which the monkeys in other locations unconsciously accessed, leading to new knowledge. Rupert Sheldrake believes that the transmission of knowledge and behavior through genetic material alone is simply not enough, that there is a force in the form of a field, a field that guides the process of growth in beings, which then takes the form of its species. According to this biologist, DNA is not the source of this process, but rather the constructed material, the receiver or recipient of information coming from such a field. This is an incredibly interesting concept and hypothesis that attempts to explain certain unsolved questions in biology. To better understand this field and the concept itself, you can imagine it as a massive internet neural network woven throughout the universe. This field permeates through space and time and is not limited by human concepts. The past and the future and all living matter are memory connected to this field. You are unconsciously connected to it via a Wi-Fi network. All your new learnings and revolutionary ideas come from this field. Two-way communication takes place between you and this field, mostly unconsciously. Your idea enters this memory field and potentially emerges in another person on the other side of the world. In this case, we come to the unconscious adoption of knowledge by another group of monkeys. I first encountered this concept quite accidentally many years ago while observing my cat. I got him as a kitten, and in his first year of life, he had no contact with other cats, yet something very interesting was happening. He did everything that other cats do. He behaved the same way and had the same rituals. You can take a kitten, isolated from the rest of the litter for a year, and that cat will have identical rituals and behavioral patterns just like any other cat in the world, without ever being able to see and copy the behaviors of other cats. I was interested in why that was the case. The search for these answers naturally led me to biology, which roughly states, what makes a cat and its behavior a cat are genes. Genes and its genetic material are simply programmed to make the cat behave like any other cat. And this is a good answer. However, I was interested in why this happens, and that is the crucial question, why? And here we come across certain problems. Take any two people on the planet and put them next to each other. Their genetic material is 99.9% .9 identical. Place a monkey next to that person. The genetic material is about 96% similar. Now place the same person next to the cat we were just talking about you will find a similarity in genetic material of 90%, which means that a human and an ordinary domestic cat share 90% of the same genetic material. Human and a mouse share 85%, human and a cow 80%, human and a fly 60%. Take a good look at what this being looks like because it contains 60% of the same genetic material as your body, which leads us to an even more bizarre situation because one banana shares 60% of genetic material with you. It may sound bizarre, but it is true. DNA is a material that is shared by all living beings. The question arises, how does that genetic material know when to make a human and when to make a fly? The answer is genetic instructions. However, in the initial stages of life, 
a human embryo is made up of identical cells, which then transform and begin to form the head, hands, legs, and teeth. What triggers the transformation of a cell and decides whether that cell will build a fly, a banana, or a human? What influences that genetic trigger? Rupert Sheldrake believes that DNA is the material that receives instructions from the morphic field, which already contains the memory for creating such a being. In other words, the beam already exists in the memory of the morphic field, and DNA simply puts everything together, like brick by brick. Ian Stevenson brings up a very interesting mystery that, according to him, explains this field. It's about phantom limbs. Often, people who have lost a certain limb, that is, an arm or a leg, experience phantom pain, feeling pain in a limb that physically does not exist. So it's not a wound that has long healed, but they feel pain in the knee or ankle, or in the whole piece of the leg that simply no longer exists. These people are not imagining this pain and discomfort, and this phenomenon has been well studied. However, there is no definitive answer as to why this happens. That pain is simply real. And according to Rupert's morphic field of memory, that leg is still in the same place. And if our body had the regenerative ability like, let's say, a lizard, that leg would grow back to the memory position of the leg in that morphic field. If genes and their instructions alone could explain such mysteries, then the case of the experiment with a common fruit fly would be impossible. By studying the fruit fly and the development of its eyes, scientists are able to disable the gene responsible for eye formation, or they can activate it in a completely different place, and an eye can form in another location. For example, like on the leg, Frankenstein has become a reality in the world of genetics. But what would happen if we permanently removed this gene? We would get a colony of blind flies, flies that after some time, despite having the eye formation gene removed, would still, through genetic mutations, develop eyes in their natural position again. So, you have physically prevented the formation of the eye by removing the gene, but after several generations, the eye would grow back in the same place. How is that possible? Sheldrake believes that the remaining genes simply draw information from the morphic field and recreate something that exists in that memory field quite naturally. According to him, this field is not limited to the living world alone, but permeates inanimate matter as well. This also explains the creation of interesting combinations in atomic structures of crystals, for example, which grow in the same way everywhere in the world. According to this man's hypotheses, your mind and consciousness are not located within your skull, and your memory is not engraved in a physical form in your brain. Instead, you are merely a receiver that is unconsciously but also consciously connected to this field. Indeed, most scientists in the field of biology consider these unproven theories and simply do not engage with such hypotheses which is a real shame because even though the morphic field has not been officially proven, it is simply because we have not developed a device to detect it, even if it exists. What has been proven is that our consciousness, through electrical impulses, is not limited to our skull and has been shown to extend beyond our bodies. So, even now, through thought, you can control various activities. The question is, where is the limit and constraint of such awareness? And in my opinion, the best way to progress and uncover such mysteries is through the collective effort of people around the world, scientific communities and individuals like Rupert Sheldrake, who bring something new, perhaps not something tangible, but still something worthy of study. Unfortunately, history tells us that one world does not tolerate the other. And often, seemingly radical but interesting ideas are dismissed from the start due to a lack of evidence and simply not being further explored. Scientists like to ask, why? Only up to a certain limit. Recently, listening to Neil deGrasse Tyson on Joe Rogan's podcast, this man became annoyed because the host kept asking him, why? until this scientist simply reached the limit of the general understanding of the scientific community. He became visibly frustrated, thinking that Joe Rogan was aiming for the ultimate answer, which is God. 
If we don't know something, surely God is behind it. However, Joe Rogan wasn't aiming for that. He was simply interested in the extent of our ignorance, which led to the annoyance of this media popular scientist. There is an expression called God of the gaps. When you reach the point of the limit of your knowledge, such people always pull God's sleeve, because surely he is responsible for such a mystery. The massive storm and waves that sank the ship. God or gods are to blame for that. Lightning bolts, a sign from God. For one thing, we have learned the precise mechanisms behind their occurrence, but then the God of the gaps simply moves forward towards a new mystery. With each new scientific discovery, divine forces shift and jump into new gaps. And so it goes on indefinitely. This brings us to genetic mutations and triggers for those mutations. Science offers, or rather attempts to offer, clear answers. For what they don't know, they say, we currently don't know, and we're working on it. They generally don't like the word mystery. People like Rupert Sheldrake offer a certain alternative, a very interesting alternative that we can't simply dismiss just because we haven't been able to measure that hypothetical morphic field with some device. This then leads other people to insert God into that new gap to fill the mystery. Time will show who is right and who is wrong, although it's possible that both sides are right. Until the next video, but until the end of space and time, we will continue to live in this cosmic soup of interacting particles, occasionally uncovering new pieces of this great puzzle.